This is Rumble with Michael Moore. I'm Michael Moore. Welcome, everyone, uh, today. In a few moments, I'll be speaking to a guest. Many of you have been requesting me to have uh, come on Rumble. Former Labor Secretary Robert Reich uh, will be my guest here. Um, he uh, is also an author and a columnist. He's an activist. You know, you know him. And uh, we're so lucky to have him uh, being one of the most important progressive voices uh, in this country. Um, I also want to thank all of you uh, who joined me on Sunday afternoon, this past Sunday, for the live Q&A. Uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, it was great getting all your questions. I had a smile on my face the, the rest of the day. Uh, so those of you who are, are paid members on the Substack, um, thank you um, for your support, and thanks for joining me on these Q&As uh, when we have them. Also, I've, I've um, posted my weekly uh, Substack uh, column. It's called Gun and Done, and it is a part two of what I'd written a week or so ago after the school shooting in Oxford, Michigan. Please check this out. I, uh, in this uh, column, in the substack here, I uh, say a number of things. I think that I, I've said in different ways before, but this time the gloves are off and I'm not, uh, not going to wait any longer to get this awful problem of ours fixed, um, violence in this country, violence we do to ourselves, violence that we do to the world. So you just go to michaelmore.com. It's free. Just mark the free box and uh, you can get this once a week. I, I put a lot of time into this. It's important to me. I love to write and I love to write and talk about and do the research and all this other stuff for the issues that we're facing right now. So you can sign up on that list. You just go to michaelmore.com. It's free. And all my writings and all these podcasts will be sent right directly to your email. And you just click on the arrow. You don't have to go through any kind of rigmarole. And you can hear my uh, my weekly podcast, too. Uh, thanks to all the people who are buying things for Christmas and uh, the holidays uh, in the Moore store. Uh, our ball caps and our crew hoodies and all this other stuff. Uh, it's been going really well. Just go to store.michaelmoore.com. There's not much time left to get things sent, but you might get lucky. Now, before we uh, bring on Robert Reich, uh, let me acknowledge our underwriters. First up is Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment in this country and around the world. It has a huge selection of audiobooks. I've done uh, my books, uh, audio form, uh, original entertainment. There's thousands of binge worthy podcasts, uh, including uh, Rumble. With Michael Moore, but you don't need to binge me because you know you're you're listening to it uh, minutes after it's uh, posted. So, but uh, but no, there's a lot of good podcasts uh, on Audible. I'm looking at my little history of of what I have from Audible uh, here on my phone. I've got the autobiography of Malcolm X. It's performed by by the way by Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, incredible uh, reading. Um, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Um, uh, of course, you know, my book, Here Comes Trouble, and the book, the uh, latest from Robert Reich, uh, The System, Who Rigged It and How We Fix It. So great stuff. You get this on Audible, and you can get it for free for 30 days uh, because you're a listener of Rumble. So you just go to Audible, that's A-U-D-I-B-L-E, audible.com slash rumble. Or you can text rumble, the word rumble, to 500, 500. So that's audible.com slash rumble or text rumble to the number 500, 500, and you'll get a free 30 day trial of Audible. And really, what better month is there than right now over the holidays, the beginning of the new year, uh, uh, to be able to listen to audiobooks, uh, either while you're driving, or you're working out? There's no better time to be listening to audiobooks. I encourage you to do that. And I thank Audible for supporting my voice by supporting this podcast. And our next underwriter for today's uh, episode is Stamps.com. Stamps.com is an approved, licensed vendor of the United States Postal Service. I'm sure everybody knows what Stamps.com is, and now they're supporting my podcast. Um, Stamps.com, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy way to skip the hassle of going to the post office, especially this time of year, and dealing with the holiday shopping traffic and 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 by doing this, too, you get to save money and you get to save time. My crew and I use them uh, when we're making our films. We do lots of shipping. 
Uh, and, you know, we are in all parts of the country, in North America and whatever we're filming. Uh, it's just one of the things that's in our kit, a ton of stamps that we got uh, uh, for less than the, the, the face value at stamps.com. If you have a subscription to stamps.com and you do it through us here, you not only get to access uh, all of the post office and UPS shipping services that you need uh, without taking the trip there, uh, it's just a, it's a great, convenient, easy thing uh, to have. And you can get discounts that you can't find elsewhere, like up to 40% off the postal service rates and 76% off United Parcel Service, UPS rates. So uh, save time and money this holiday season with Stamps.com. Thank you for supporting my show. And by the way, people listening, uh, if you want a special offer that includes a, a four-week trial, free postage, whoa, and a digital scale, you go uh, sign up at stamps.com and then you use the promo code MORE, my last name, two O's, M O O R E. Uh, and there are no long term commitments to this. No, they're not going to just sign you up for another year without you knowing. None of this stuff that goes on. There's no long term commitments or contracts. So just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code MORE, M O O R E. Thanks for joining us uh, today. We have a very special guest with us. Robert Reich is one of the great progressive voices in our country, especially when it comes to labor, economic issues, and the plight of the working class and the poor in this country. He's the former U.S. Secretary of Labor, a professor at Cal Berkeley, and the author of several books, most recently, The System, Who Rigged It? Now we fix it. Most importantly, he is now on Substack. So like my Substack at michaelmoore.com, you can keep up with all of Robert Reich's writings, thinking, uh, even his drawings, uh, which are incredible. Um, and you can do that at, it's very simple, uh, robertreich.substack.com. Bob, it's a great honor to welcome you. Thank you for coming on. It's just a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. There's so many play things here I want to get into. You know, can we just start with this thing that has just driven me up the wall in the last few weeks? Inflation, inflation, inflation. And I tried to explain to me, like, there was a thing out today, inflation is up on some category. And I said, but yeah, but we weren't doing that last year. Of course it's up. It's up over last year. It's the same thing where they released the crime statistics in New York uh, today and Transit crime is up 106%. That's right, because a year ago, this time, nobody was riding the subway. Very few people, just the essential workers were riding it. So yes, uh, everything's up in that, in that sense. But why is the media pounding and pounding away on this uh, and, and not doing it with context? You know, that in, especially in, in, the, in the sense of inflation. I'm not saying that things aren't costing more. But I think that there's a reason for this. And I think that I'm guessing there's a reason Biden uh, doesn't look too concerned that he knows that we're in this transition and we'll be out of it. Is that just wishful thinking? Or I would love to hear your take on this because uh, you teach this, you write about it, uh, and you've served there in the White House uh, dealing with this. Yeah, well, Michael, there there's several factors here. Number one, the media, I mean, particularly the corporate mainstream media, I think that they have wanted to, consciously or unconsciously, they want to treat Biden the same way they treated Trump. I mean, it's kind of a false equivalence. So they're going to beat him up, uh, even though the economy, with with everything except inflation considered, the economy is, is going gangbusters. I mean, economic growth, uh, job growth. Uh, everything is way up, doing remarkably well. But because of this one issue of prices going up, I think the media just found something to, to bang over its head. Uh, now, your point about obviously prices are going to go up because the economy is now coming back is exactly right. Because obviously, if there are a lot of people suddenly buying stuff because they 
feel like the pandemic may be over and they're a little bit relieved and they're a little bit, they have a lot of pent up demand for all kinds of things they didn't, didn't buy for the last year and a half. Uh, well, that's going to create a lot of, of economic demand and that demand itself is going to drive up prices because you, you, you can't just uh, snap your fingers and create enough supply to meet that demand. I mean, there are going to be bottlenecks and shortages of, of all kinds of things. And that obviously drives up prices temporarily. Now, what does temporarily mean? How long a price is going to be driven up? Uh, nobody knows. But there is one other factor that nobody is talking about enough, in my view, and that is monopolization. Mm -hmm. You've got you've got a huge number of big corporations in America that have never made as much money as they're making now, and that are using the excuse of inflation as a reason to raise their prices and make even more money. And that's a big, big issue and a big problem. How how is it that corporate America has been recording record profits during a global pandemic? Uh, what, what, what's, there's got to be an, an easy answer to this because, well, well, yeah, I, I, I think Michael, the easy answer is monopolization. I mean, starting with Amazon, you know, you've got a pandemic, people are not going to buy in retail stores. They're, they're afraid to go out. So, uh, they're going to order through Amazon and to a lesser extent through Walmart's online system. Uh, well, that gives Amazon and Walmart a real, uh, a real monopoly. Uh, over retail sales. And that's exactly what's happened. That's driven Amazon's and Walmart's online uh, profits, which have been huge. I mean, just right. unbelievably large. Uh, but you also have uh, all through the economy, you've got, you've got one or two firms dominating uh, certain industries. I mean, look at Procter and Gamble. Uh, and uh, Kimberly Clark. I mean, they to the, uh, together, they basically own consumer staples. So to the extent that there's any demand, uh, say for toilet paper, remember the run on toilet paper at the start yeah. of the pandemic? Well, they had a monopoly. I mean, they could charge basically whatever they wanted. Uh, and they have made record profits. Uh, they announced just in April, both of them simultaneously, that they would char start charging even more for toilet paper and for, uh, all, you know, all sorts of consumer, uh, you know, diapers, everything else. Uh, but, and they, they, they excused it by saying it was rising costs for raw materials. But actually, it turns out they have never made as much money. Their profit margins are huge. Uh, they don't need to raise prices, but they're raising prices because, because they can. And that means more money. And they did do that. And so what you're saying is, the problem with monopolies was already a problem before the pandemic. This was the, this Amazon and Procter and Gamble and anybody else we could name that was already baked in to our yeah. economic system so that when the pandemic took place, we were at the mercy of essentially a few companies and a delivery system that had uh, taken over uh, the, the former various means of delivery. And they were able to, have at it and 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 do as do as they wanted uh, when it came to us, the consumers, the citizens. Yep. Uh, sadly, uh, tragically, that's exactly right. And what the pandemic did is give them a kind of an opportunity to exercise the monopoly power they already had, but do it in a in a more flagrant example, a more flagrant way. I mean, half of all recent grocery price increases, for example. A lot of people know that grocery prices are going up. Half of them, uh, of that grocery price increase in recent months has come from beef and pork and poultry. Well, they're just four large conglomerates that control almost all of the market for meat processing of beef, pork, and poultry. And they've been raising prices like mad, taking advantage of the fact that consumers basically don't know what's going on and they can blame it on inflation. So is, is there anything Biden can do about this? Is, can he put a stop to this, this, what essentially is the gouging of people when they're already suffering uh, through a pandemic and whether they've had COVID or not, whether it's uh, they've lost their job or not, or or they're having to work at home, or the kids are at home because of school, you know. Just I mean, the, you understand the massive uh, weight that uh, the public 
are, are carrying with all of this? Is there something that their president, the one that, that a majority of the Americans voted for, sitting there in the Oval Office, is there something uh, he can do? Because it seems like if he doesn't do anything, uh, we're going to be in deep trouble come the midterm elections uh, next year. Yeah. Well, one thing he could do in the short term, uh, he could do what we have done in this country during wartime. And that is that if a, a major company or a major industry raises its pri- prices beyond a baseline, uh, that was, you know, what their prices used to be, uh, they've got to pay uh, excess profits taxes, uh, you know, because obviously everybody knows that they're profiteering from the war. Uh, that's what we did in World War II. Why, why shouldn't we do that again? Uh, the other thing he can and should do uh, is to use antitrust law to basically break up these monopolies or threaten that if they continue to raise their prices using inflation as the flimsy excuse uh, he's going to break them up. Will he do that? Well, he's not going to use, I don't think he'll, he'll go after the excess profits, the profiteering, but, uh, or at least I haven't heard a word said about that. Not even uh, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren have, has talked about that. Too bad. I, I think they should. Uh, but uh, he has talked about antitrust and he's strengthening antitrust authorities. Uh, the unfortunate part of that is that, uh, you know, that takes years to yeah. actually mount an antitrust case. What he needs to do now is say, look, uh, Procter & Gamble or Kimberly Clark or you major, you know, PepsiCo or anybody else who's, who's, who's ramping up prices and using the excuse of inflation to do so. Look, if you continue to do this, I, I'm going to crack down on you. I know you're a monopolist. Uh, and, and we're, you know, I can't tell you we're going to get you right away, but we're going to, we're going to do this. You better stop. Why do you think that, um, Americans right now are so unhappy with with Joe Biden, you know, his, his approval ratings and everything. I'm just I'm kind of surprised to see it. And maybe you're right. This could just also be a holdover of people have just had it uh, from Trump, four years of Trump, or whatever. One answer might also be that maybe all of our expectations were so high uh, and that hopes were bound to be dashed. But, um, you know, I you know, I was out there uh, campaigning with Bernie. And, um, and in the primary uh, in uh, Michigan, I, I voted for um, Bernie, uh, not Biden. But as soon as, you know, it, he was running, I and others, I think we did what we could do. And, and he turned out once uh, elected, at least what he was saying and starting to do, leaned, leaned more toward Bernie than it did toward Joe Manchin. Um, and I was very happy about that, and I was happy to hear the things that he was saying. He did he did sign a number of uh, executive orders. Did some very good things for people uh, to re, to help reduce poverty and hunger, and and uh, uh, just a little thing where he eliminated the student loan debt that disabled people were carrying. That they that he just got rid of that. I mean, it was just like a lot of little things like that. But now it, it, it just seems um, um, these uh, approval ratings and the and and the not getting the human infrastructure bill passed yet, having to cut it down so much to try and get Mansion and Cinema on board. Uh, the people are, I think, the vote is getting depressed. The people who voted for him, and uh, especially if you're a person of color. The, the voting rights thing that seems to have disappeared um, that we need so desperately. So I don't know. I'm, that's just me babbling on, but I'm just curious of, of, of what, what's your take on this with Biden? And, and if, if you were giving him counsel, what would, what would you suggest that, that he do right now? Well, well my counsel would be, uh, g- uh, you know, give a lot of fireside chats uh, what Franklin D. Roosevelt used to do, you know, get out there, talk to the American people, explain why voting rights, what you said just then, Michael, are so critically important because we need to fight against the forces of fascism uh, that are determined to take away our democracy. Uh, and this is not a problem only for people of color. This is a problem for all of us who care about democracy. I, I, th- I think he's got to get out there and, and, and show himself as a fighter not just for infrastructure. I mean, that's good. I'm glad we got an infrastructure bill and, and not just for 
uh, you know, Build Back Better and uh, the good things that are in Build Back Better. Uh, but he's got to show himself to be willing to get out there and express a little bit of outrage uh, because that's what a lot of us feel right now. The first six months, uh, he was doing a lot of stuff, but then he ran into a, a, a kind of roadblock. Uh, and that is Manchin and cinema, and it's obviously every Republican member of Congress. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's got to, I think, convince people that he is really on their side in a very dramatic way. Uh, that's what I would advise. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, uh, we certainly don't want him to give up. And we need, I, I think that when people start to see some economic help, it gets passed uh, by Congress and immediate economic help. You know, remember Obamacare took years before people got to see the benefits of, of that because they, they built that into the bill that it wasn't going to happen right away. Um, and it just seems that, <clears throat> I don't know. Do I need to, do I need to go down there and move into the basement of the white house and just kind of be there, help out, hold his hand, uh, help, help with the messaging. I don't I don't know what, yeah, maybe uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Michael, doing that, I, I, you can tell them if the guards at the door ask you, uh, just tell them that I sent you. Okay, that's I. That will work. I know. I know uh, that will work. And and you know, I I've noticed too that he has been listening to his granddaughters, who have, I've been very good on all these issues, and he seems to he seems to care deeply about this next generation and what we're leaving them with, and. Um, you know, I just, um, I don't know. I, you're just hearing the frustration from me that um, you could hear from anybody on the street. Probably. No, you care. Look, at, I, I feel as frustrated as you do. I mean, really, I, I find myself, I have this, uh, the photogra- this photograph of Franklin D. Roosevelt on my desk. And every morning I'm yelling at Franklin D. Roosevelt saying, what are the Democrats doing? Why aren't they doing more? Why isn't Biden out there? Uh, you know, like you, Franklin D. Roosevelt, talking about the, you know, the, 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 the captains of industry uh, who were plotting against him uh, and saying, as Franklin D. Roosevelt said in 1936, I welcome, I welcome your, your, your anger. I welcome your hate. Uh, but Biden, uh, by personality, by inclination, uh, doesn't seem to want to do that. Uh, I do agree with you that if he gets this Build Back Better bill through, uh, despite Manchin, if he gets it through, if he gets these votes that he needs, uh, even if it happens in January or February, uh, that's going to be good for a lot of people. It's going to be important for a lot of people. It continues, uh, for example, the uh, child tax credit, uh, which yeah. otherwise is going to disappear right. uh, on the 18th of January. Uh, you know, they, they, we're talking about real people's real lives, uh, but uh, Biden needs to show he... He, he's, he's, he's as outraged as we are. Let me ask you a Secretary of Labor question here. Um, this victory of Starbucks employees in Buffalo this past week, uh, I think, is reverberating across America, uh, not in the pundit class, but amongst the everyday average worker. And, um, you know, I, you and I know, and I think a lot of the public knows, that what occurred at this one Starbucks store is part of a much larger pattern taking place right now with a surge in strikes and labor actions uh, across the country. Are you hopeful for this? And is there any way that everybody listening to this can be supportive of uh, this workforce, which is, you know, in many cases, young, it's, it's people of color, it's women, you know, they're, they're the, they're the real foundation of, of, of what I see as a movement that is now in progress. Well, I'm uh, very optimistic about this. I, I think that, uh, you know, we've been dooming and glooming about Biden and, and what happens in Congress or what's not happening in Congress. Uh, but uh, what really does make me optimistic is the activism we're seeing at the rank and file uh, in the labor movement, uh, not just this one Starbucks. I mean, this is a big deal. You have to understand how big a deal this is because Starbucks has based its entire business model for decades on avoiding unions. 
you know, and it, it talks about corporate social responsibility. It talks a good game about how wonderful Starbucks is for its community and for its workers. Well, that's just bullshit. I mean, in, in point of fact, what this has revealed, this labor struggle, is that Starbucks is just like every other corporation. It's just trying to make as much money as possible and keep wages as low as possible. Uh, and so I think that this one little victory is hugely important. Other Starbucks outlets and stores are going to be unionizing, I think, fairly quickly. And at the same time, you've got uh, companies like Kellogg's, you know, big, big companies that are you know, where the workers are striking. I think the way to, we, you know, we ought to boycott Kellogg's products. Uh, we ought to, every time we walk into a Starbucks, we ought to tell the baristas and the workers there, we are with you. You ought to unionize. We want you to unionize. Uh, we should uh, communicate however we can, maybe boycott Amazon until Amazon really allows unionization. It's been using terrible anti-labor techniques for years now, uh, including what happened in Bessemer, Alabama. Uh, and I, I think that our voices as consumers, uh, as citizens, ought to be very loud about labor solidarity. Also, in addition to the labor actions taking place, it seems like this country um, is experiencing an unofficial general strike because across the country, people are refusing to return to backbreaking or mind-numbing low-wage jobs. And again, the pundit class on uh, cable news and elsewhere on the internet, they're just, they're just aghast that people are not coming back to work. And of course, the Republicans make speech after speech on the floor in Congress about al almost we have to punish them to take a whip to them to get them to get back to work because we need we need their work and we need their work at at you know seven dollars and 25 cents an hour and uh and people are refusing people are no i'm not going back to that i'm not going to do this I'm not gonna, this is the moment and the and the pandemic has given me time to think about this and and take advantage of the moment is it wrong to say that there's a an unofficial general st strike going on here. What is going on here? And how can we all either help encourage um, and help those most in need, uh, low wage workers uh, to benefit from this moment? Well, I think it is in fact an unofficial general strike. Uh, and you, you see it not only in terms of the actual strikes that are going on, but also the extraordinary, uh, unprecedented number of workers who are quitting their jobs. We're saying basically, uh, I've had it. I, you know, I'm 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 just not going to take this anymore. Or you have a very almost record level uh, of low labor participation, and that means that of all of the adults of working age who could be working, uh, you have really relatively few, about sixty-one, almost sixty-two percent, who are actually in jobs. Uh, but the jobs are there; they just don't want them. And here's an important, a little piece of sort of rhetorical device. I'm, what you hear through the mainstream media and the conservatives and the Republicans, they all say there's a labor shortage. Well, there's not a labor shortage. Mm -hmm. What we have is a shortage of living wage jobs. We have a shortage of childcare. We've got a shortage of paid leave. We've got a shortage of health care for workers. I mean, these are the real shortages. This is why people are saying, I, I, I've, I, I've gone through this pandemic it's given me a chance to reevaluate where I am, and I'm just, I, I am just not going to go back to the old situation I was in before. You know, I, I read your uh, writings in the, in the Guardian, and I think, did you recently write uh, something about this tax loophole, the uh, carried interest loophole? I can't remember, or maybe I just read it in the Guardian, but. Yeah, I did. I, okay, you I did. did. Okay, so I did, I read you what you wrote. So, yeah. so would you explain this to people, and, and people who are listening, please don't glaze over on this, because. You did not tune in today to listen to us talk about a hundred and eighty billion dollar uh, carried interest tax loophole. But you, but I no 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 don't don't glaze over every time. So the danger here yeah. is every time we talk about taxes. Yes, you know people think oh my god I can't listen anymore because it's taxes yeah. and it's complicated. No, no, listen to this. Listen to this. Would you explain this to people because this is mind boggling. Well, this is important because the private equity industry. These are the people who are the corporate raiders who go into companies, they buy them up, and then they cut jobs, they cut wages, they outsource jobs, they privatize, uh, they, they basically destroy a lot of communities. This is private equity, 
Uh, these are the corporate raiders. These people have been subsidized for years by a special tax break for which there is absolutely no economic justification. It's called the carried interest. I don't want to get into the technicalities because your eyes really will glaze over. But the, the important thing to know is that administration after administration comes in and says, whether it's Democrat or Republican, we are going to get rid of the carried interest loophole. This is what Obama said, and then nothing happened. This is what even Donald Trump, believe it or not, Donald Trump said, I'm going to get rid of the carried interest loophole. And he had a big tax break uh, for the wealthy and for big corporations. And he kept the carried interest there. Uh, and right now, the Democrats are trying to find ways of funding what Biden wants to do. The Build Back Better plan. Uh, now, one of the most obvious ways of doing it is to close this notorious loophole, this carried interest loophole. This is $180 billion of loophole over 10 years. Uh, this is not chump change. We're chumps if we don't close the loophole. <laughs> right. But, but uh, you know, it's not even listed among the Democrats' loopholes and things that they want to do uh, because the Democrats are so... And this is, saddens me to say this, Michael, because I, I am a Democrat. I'm a loyal Democrat. I, I think the Republicans are very dangerous. The Republican Party is a proto-fascist party right now. Uh, but the Democrats are too enthralled by Wall Street's money, by private equity money, by the lobbyists and the, and the campaign cash. Uh, and they've got, to, they've got to close this loophole. If people want to write or call their representatives, uh, what's what's the one line that they need to give to the person who picks up the phone in their senator's or their congressperson's office? Well, it's six words. Close the fucking private equity <laughs> carried interest loophole. Maybe that's eight eight words. That's eight because you went blue, but uh, yeah. that's okay. No, people can handle it. Yes, I really encourage people to do this. And the other thing I think a lot of people don't understand you constantly they beat away on this. Oh, Social Security, it's going to run out in 10 years. It's going to run out in five years. And and it's like I, people do not understand. And maybe you could explain. I've tried to explain it, but I think it'll, it'll come across better. If you can explain that um, those of you who are working your basic job and you're making 50, 60, 70,000 a year, so, you know, what used to be thought of as a middle-class job, but no longer. Um, and you look at your paycheck, and it shows how much has been taken out for Social Security and, and uh, Medicare. And, uh, and your employer has to provide their match of that. But let's just say roughly, I don't, it cha the percent changes from year to year, but roughly around 7% of your income goes to Social Security. And... I don't think a lot of people know that if you make more than I think it's right now about $130,000 a year, anybody who makes more than $130,000 a year, they only pay the 7% on the first $130,000. You have to pay it on your entire income. They only have to pay it up to $130,000. And then here's their percentage of what they pay for everything they make over $130,000. And that percentage that goes to Social Security is zero. We, can you yeah, that's right. Well, th this is yeah, this is please. one of the one of the real regressive regressive aspects of Social Security. There is a cap, as you said, uh, and it goes a little bit up every year. I don't know what it is this year, but it's around one hundred thirty, one hundred thirty five thousand yeah. dollars. Well, any dollar you earn above that, you don't have to pay any Social Security tax at all. Uh, and yet, of course, you make Social Security. You 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 get it back when you retire. Uh, so. Uh, for example, Elon Musk finishes, to the extent that he contributes any, any Social Security, but he would finish contributing to Social Security probably about eight minutes past midnight on the first of the year. Uh, Jeff Bezos. I mean, these people have such extraordinary incomes that they reach that cap very, very, very quickly, whereas most people pay for throughout the year. And as you said, it's 7% of your income. Your, your employer is supposed to put in another 7%. If you are, you know, if you're working, if you're self-employed, you got to pay the whole 14%. But you are paying in. It is your right, but the system is rigged against you in terms of there being this cap. Get rid of the cap. There's no reason for a cap. Absolutely. All income, yes. all income ought to be subject to Social Security. 
if you, the $60,000 a year employee, have to pay 7% on your entire income, uh, even though you and I don't support this kind of uh, flat tax, nonetheless, why shouldn't then everybody, including the rich, have to pay 7% of their income? Just just do that. Just make them pay. The, the, I, read, I don't know if it was you or somebody else I read that if they act, if the wealthy and everybody over that one hundred and thirty five thousand a year, if they had to pay that seven percent, uh, and the government had to match it, that w- that w- the social security system would be s- solvent immediately until almost the uh, 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 the the twenty second century. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, and in fact, social security, uh, even as it is right now, it ought to be expanded. I mean, Bernie Sanders. Uh, when he presented to Biden uh, a draft agenda for the Build Back Better, he said, we, we ought to include, uh, you know, in Medicare and Social Security, it ought to be bigger. I mean, there ought to be a Medicare dental and Medicare hearing and there ought to be and Social Security needs to really be larger because, you know, so many costs for elderly people like pharmaceuticals are going are, are soaring. Well, we wouldn't have to worry about that if the Social Security system required everybody to pay at least, at least the same minimal percentage of their income. Uh, and uh, by the way, I, you know, in my former life as Secretary of Labor, I was a trustee of the Social Security Trust Fund. So I know that it's not going to go out of money. It, it, that is, that it's, it's not going to lose money. It's not going to, you're going to get your social security. I promise you, because uh, look, all of the money that goes into social security goes into the same general fund as taxpayers money, as income taxes, as, 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 as every other tax into the federal government. Uh, and the only reason that social security is under any stress right now as a trust fund is that the federal government for years has been borrowing money from the social security trust fund. Mm-hmm. Hello. So, right. Right. <laughs> you know, in other words, not only is there this ex- extraordinary regressive tax that caps your payments into social security, but also you've got this mythology being propounded propounded by Republicans and conservatives that Social Security is not going to be there for you, when of course it's going to be there for you. Right. But you see the the genius, the evil genius of them trying to whip up this kind of fear, especially anybody who's in their 50s or 60s now, they're getting ready to receive Social Security, and all they hear is, we're out of money, we're going to be out of money, it's going to close. And and the, 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 the governments, we're not the only ones who do this. The way that they use fear to instill fear in the population to where they, people then can't think straight. It then makes it very hard for people like you or myself or whatever to try to present the truth, the facts, and we're not, and just that, but we're trying to get, you and I and others are trying to get to an, presenting an alternate way that we could live. We could live better as people. Uh, we could take care of each other better and all this. And, I, I just, um, this is why, I mean, I think your work is so valuable. And I didn't mention at the beginning, this incredible documentary you made. What is it now? A decade? Uh, inequality for all. Uh, I, you, you just type it in anywhere on the internet. You can find it. You need to watch this film. It's still so relevant uh, today. I did that with a, with, a, with a wonderful filmmaker, talented filmmaker named Jake Kornbluth. Uh, oh, yes, and, uh, right. It's still, it's still being used in classrooms around the country. Thank you for that. Uh, but, Michael, back to your, your main point, uh, and that is that uh, you're right. Fear sells better than hope. And what conservatives and Republicans uh, have been doing for years is getting people even more scared, more, more fearful than they already yeah. are. Uh, and whether it's Social Security or anything else. I mean, the good, the good news is that Social Security and Medicare are hugely popular. That's why Republicans hate them, uh, because they're so popular, because they prove the government works. Right. I mean, a lot of Republicans, you know, they're, they're fearful that there are going to be other programs like, uh, you know, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, that are going to be as popular as Medicare and Social Security. And then what are Republicans going to do? I mean, then, then it's going to really be, it's a slippery slope, they say. Uh, well, it's not a slippery slope. American workers are treated worse than workers in any other modern advanced country in terms of 
what they get on the job and what they get from government. You wrote another amazing op-ed uh, this week. I'm going to I'm going to post the link to it here on my podcast uh, platform site for people who are listening because uh, I would really love for you to read this. And I was I was a little I mean I was kind of taken aback, but but because I thought it was you've made a bold statement and taken a bold stand. The the uh, the title of the op-ed is why I don't trust the mainstream media. Now this is coming from somebody you have lived a portion of your life on the mainstream media since you were uh, the secretary of labor and, and actually before that. And, um, and we all love hearing your take on things, but this explain, explain your position here because I thought, you know, you're right. If, if, if we, all of us, if we don't kind of put our foot down here, uh, we, we just become part of the, the problem because we're not addressing the fact that the public is not is not being engaged in the way. And when you talk about the war we're in now with the pandemic and how the profiteers have taken advantage of that, you know, the other war we're in is for our democracy, as you've pointed out, the proto-fascist uh, way that, the, that those who are still trying to take it over, hope to take it over next year. Uh, it's a serious thing. People are scared. Um, and we need a free press now more than ever. But boy, this just just give us a, just a, a taste of what here of what you wrote in this op-ed, and I'll encourage people to to read it for themselves. Well, I, I want to be very clear about this, and that is that I I certainly don't trust the right wing crazy media. I mean, yes, I don't trust course. Fox News or you know all of these other uh, you know imitators. I mean, th those are really dangerous. Uh, but uh, no, I don't think the mainstream media is 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 guilty of fake news. I think that the mainstream media and the reason I don't really trust them and I look elsewhere, but I do read the major. I mean, I, I read the New York Times. I read the Washington Post. Uh, it's not that I think there's very good reporting, but we can't possibly limit ourselves to these mainstream media outlets because they are they they favor the status quo for one thing. I, I mean, constantly reporters are asking progressives uh, like Bernie Sanders or AOC or anybody else, uh, how do you justify uh, the huge costs of Medicare for all or anything or or a Green New Deal without asking uh, how in the world can we possibly afford not having a Green New Deal or Medicare for all. In other words, they're positing a false choice here. It's, they're not looking at the other side of the, of the equation, which is the cost of not doing something. Uh, or the mainstream media, to take yet another example, is, is guilty of this constant false equivalence. Uh, I mean, they're constantly saying, well, they're extremists on both sides. You got the extremists who are the, the, the Trumpers who are trying to take over democracy. And you got the extremists in the Democratic Party, the AOCs and the Bernie Sanders who are what? Why are they extremists? Well, they're extremists because they're fighting for democracy. They're extremists because they want to help working people. I mean, there's no comparison. How can you compare destroying democracy on the one hand uh, with what uh, these 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 the Democratic part of the Democratic Party is trying to do? I, I, that's that's also what the mainstream media keeps keeps doing. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we we've got to be very careful about how issues are framed. Uh, I keep on telling my students and anybody else who will listen, uh, you've got to read and respond critically to the news. You're going to ask yourself, what's not being reported? What are the underlying assumptions that are being made that are not actually necessarily true? Uh, what do you need from the media that you are not getting? And make sure you get it. There are other ways of getting it. What do you, what, where do you go for that information? What else, you know, obviously, yes, the Times and the and Post and, and uh, you know, there's good things even on, on cable uh, TV and, um, but, but you must have other places. I mean, where would you direct people? Like suggest something to people listening to this right now. Well, I, I, you know, there are a number of places I do. I mean, I spend, you know, a good amount of time early in the morning uh, trying to keep up with what's happening. And I do, you know, I look at the Times, I look at the New York, the, uh, the Washington Post, uh, but I also make a point of, of, of looking at uh, the American Prospect, uh, which, uh, mm -hmm. by the way, I helped found 25 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I, I look at a number of blogs that I've found very helpful over the years, like the Daily Coast. Uh, I, um, 
you know, even I would urge people, I, you know, I'm part of a little team uh, called Inequality Media. Uh, and we put out a lot of material every day, every week, a lot of videos. Uh, I think uh, I, I can say without fear of contradiction that these are very important explainers about what's happening in this country. Uh, and I also look to Substack. I mean, your Substack, Michael, uh, I hope people read my Substack. There's some very good uh, sort of independent journalism out there. Yes. Yeah, it's very true. I consider myself, as I think you do as well, uh, yourself, uh, a, a public educator. I mean, that's what I do. I, I teach uh, at Berkeley. I, I, I do videos. I do Substack. I write for The Guardian. By the way, The Guardian is also another very useful, very important, non-corporate uh, uh uh, daily source of information I go to first thing in the morning. Yes, American Prospect, still David Dayen there, still doing great work. Yep. I encourage people to check that out. And, and if they're watching things on their, on their devices, on television or whatever, is there any place, anything you want to suggest uh, is a good place to go to be informed? Good question. I, I mean, I like many progressives. I, I like uh, MSNBC, Rachel Maddow, and so on. Uh, but um, I, I, I'm, it's not really, I guess what worries me is that all of these, uh, television outlets or, uh, or, or this, any, anything you, you, you see on a regular daily basis, uh, on television, uh, tends to be competing for eyeballs so much that it becomes a little bit sensationalized. Uh, so I appreciate news sources that give me context. Uh, that don't just get me outraged. I mean, outrage is important. I want people to be outraged appropriately, but I also want them to know why they're outraged. Again, I can't thank you enough for um, how you keep us educated about this. And um, uh, it, it means a lot to me. It means a lot to a lot of people listening to this. And um, what do we have to look forward to in the coming year? Uh, wh where are you going to be? What are you going to be doing? Um, what, what should we look out for? Well, I'm going to be doing exactly what I've been doing, <laughs> what I keep on doing, you know, writing and, and substacking and doing videos with inequality media and, and trying to, uh, uh, I've also started to do more and more TikToks, uh, believe it or not. I mean, it's a good way of getting to young people. I, 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 I'm, I will do anything I possibly can in my power to educate people, particularly young people, uh, but uh, next, next year is going to be tricky because next year is going to be the year of the midterm elections. When you get into the uh, gravitational pull of the midterms, uh, I'm, I'm worried, frankly, because I am watching what the Republicans are doing at the state level in many states, many swing states, and I see that they are laying the groundwork for what could be the end of democracy. And I'm not overstating this. I don't no. mean to be sensational about this. No, that's not, uh, and so, that's not hyperbole. No, you're right. No, no. And, and so next year is going to be really, really important. The midterms take on a whole new dimension. Well, um, we'll be looking forward to seeing uh, what you'll be posting, doing, saying. TikTok, yes, you're on TikTok. Like, I'm not even there yet. So no, you've got to get, you've got to be there. You've so got to be just there. Just encouraging I mean, me. Yes. I'm I mean, I, that I, down I, on my New Year's resolution list. Well, my son, my son, I've got two sons and they say to me, dad, uh, how much dignity are you willing to lose? <laughs> uh, and I say, hey, you know, if it educates people, I don't care. I'm going to dance. I'm going to do anything I can to, to help educate young people. There's no shame in doing that. No. So thank you. Thank you for doing it, Bob, uh, and, and for coming on to Rumble here. Um, we hear New York City behind me. Uh, one of these 60-degree uh, days in December that we probably shouldn't be having but um, are enjoying. Thank you, and uh, I've been talking to Robert Reich, former Secretary of Labor uh, and uh, now professor at uh, Berkeley and, uh, and so many so many great books and films and now videos and now TikTok. Uh, and uh, I may have to call you up for 
uh, instructions. Uh, oh, M- Michael, you listen, I, I just want you to know how much I appreciate what you've been doing. And uh, anytime you want to do it, we'll, we'll, we could start you on TikTok. Maybe you and I do something together on TikTok just, just to get the ball rolling. Oh, I love you. Is that, is that, is that a promise? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's, uh, Basil, that's what we're going to, that's what we're, that'll be one of the early things we do in the new year. Um, okay. Many thanks. And to all of you who are uh, listening, look for the links here on the podcast page uh, to go to Robert Reich's uh, uh, wonderful work. Read his Substack too. This great Substack, Bob. Thank you so much. Okay, Mike. You take care of yourself. Okay, be well. Uh, have a good holiday and uh, uh, stay warm. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Bye. So that was just great to have have Robert Reich on on Rumble here. Uh, we'll have him on again. So you will see sometime in January, Robert Reich teaching me TikTok. No better way to begin the new year. My thanks to our executive producer, Basil Hamden, our editor and sound engineer, Nick Nick Quaz, uh, the jack of all trades, not some of the trades, all trades, Donald Bornstein, and everyone here who's helped us put this podcast together, and all of you for listening to it. That's it, everybody. Thanks for listening to Rumble with Michael Moore. I'm Michael Moore.